I told you earlier that it was 21 degrees this morning when I left for church. I came in early today. And it's not going to be a lot warmer today. It's going to get into the 30s. But I want you to think August for a moment. I want you to think it's 102 degrees outside for the story I'm about to tell you. It was a day like that, a day when there was no air stirring. It was just hot and humid and sticky and awful. And the sheriff was sitting in his office with the fan blowing on him, and it wasn't doing any good, and the phone rang. And he picked up the phone, he heard, Sheriff, and he knew who it was. It was Mrs. Smith. She said, Sheriff, I looked out the window, and you know what I saw down in the creek? There are boys down there, and they're naked. They're swimming. They're skinny dipping. Get them out of there. And the sheriff sort of sighed. He said, all right, Miss Smith, let me see what I can do. And he goes out, and here are some boys out there, about 12, 13 years old, playing in the water, trying to cool off. And he looked up, and he could see her house, and he thought, wow, that's pretty good that she could see him this far. She must have some good eyesight. He said, boys, just move down. Move down about, you know. 20 yards from here, go down the creek a little bit and you'll be fine. He goes back to his office, he sits down, turns back on his fan, he's sitting there trying to cool off and the phone rings again and it's Miss Smith again. She's gone, Sheriff, I told you those boys are out there skinny dipping and they're naked and I don't want to see it. And he said, Miss Smith, how could you possibly see that? He said, I moved them down the stream, did they come back up? She said, no, but if I climb out on my porch roof, go up my downspout to the roof, go out, hang off the end of the lightning rod, and I get my binoculars, I can still see them. It's not really a story. It's not even really a joke. It's not all that funny, is it? But what it is, is a fable. And the moral of the story is, those who look for trouble will always find it. Those who look to see the sins of others will always find them very clearly, especially instead of looking at their own sin. Now, I said we're talking about Jesus and table fellowship. Although this isn't about Jesus sitting down with a Pharisee today, this is about Jesus being questioned about his disciples coming to the table without washing their hands. First and foremost, we're not talking about washing your hands like we're washing our hands now for COVID and wearing a mask and things like this. By all means, wash your hands before you eat. But we're talking a very specific situation right here. And in the gospel we read this morning, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew was writing as a Jew to a very Jewish audience, trying to show them that this was indeed the Messiah. That's why he's always quoting, Jesus is always quoting the Psalms and he's quoting Isaiah just as he did in the passage today. So he doesn't explain, but in the other gospel, it explains that they were following what Jesus had done and Jesus had been accused by Pharisees at a meal, just like the one we talked about last week where he was invited to dinner. And he's sitting there and they said to him, teacher, why don't you observe the tradition of the elders and wash your hands before you eat? The tradition of the elders. This is something that's not scriptural. It's called Mishnah. It's called a collection of oral traditions that rise up around the scripture, but they're not scriptural. They're not part of the law. But it had become the tradition of the elders, but before they ate a meal, they would go and they'd wash their hands. Not to clean their hands before they ate, but to wash their hands to show that they were clean in the spiritual sense. It was part of their understanding of what it meant to be clean before God. And so they would wash their hands. But Jesus' disciples just sat down at the table without doing this, and they were judged very harshly for that. And they said to him, Teacher, why in the world do you have disciples who just totally disregard the tradition of the elders? Now, for them to say this means that they're conflating this mission of this oral tradition the tradition of washing hands with scripture. So what Jesus is doing in this story and what his disciples are doing is sinning against the elders of the church, not against God, but against the elders. They're very offended by this. And Jesus does something uncharacteristic for himself that we're not used to. He sort of just gets in their face back and he says, you want to know what tradition is? He said, the law says what? You give your parents, you honor your parents, you take care of them, but you say, ah, ha, 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 I cannot do that for my gift is korban. Korban is a gift that is sort of like putting a freeze on your bank account, saying, I can't spend this because it's dedicated to God. And according to some biblical scholars that I've read, that was a convenient way of saying, I can't spend this on what the law requires me to do, which is to care for my aging, ailing parents because I might be spending that for things for God and God's purpose. And Jesus rightly says, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You have twisted the tradition so that it supersedes the law. And then he says to them the words that we read this morning, 
It's not what goes in, it's what comes out that defiles you. What you eat, he has to explain this to the disciples because they don't get it. Because they come to him and they say, you know, they're really offended by what you said, Lord. And he says, whatever God did not plant, God's not going to reap. And Peter says, can you please explain this to us? You can sort of see Jesus sighing and rolling his eyes there. And he says, oh, ha, ha, you're so slow, a little dull. Can't you get it? What you eat, what you take in your body, whether it's with clean hands or dirty hands, goes through you and out the other end into the sewer. And it's not going to affect anything. But what comes out of your mouth is what comes out of your heart. And those are the things that defile a person. It's not what you eat that makes you unclean. It's how you speak to and about others. That's a hard one, isn't it? Because Jesus is telling them, that they need to be careful what they say to others. They need to be careful about judging. He says a lot about judging. He says a lot about judging in these passages that we're reading in the next couple weeks and the ones that we read the last two weeks. To focus on the ritual, Jesus is saying, is to miss the point. To focus on tradition over righteousness is missing the point. And he wants us to think about what it is that we're saying and doing and where those motivations come from. There are a lot of motivations to come to church. Some people come to church because they want to be in the presence of God. They want to be with their brothers and sisters in Christ. Heaven knows I miss you looking at the empty pews this morning, staring at a camera to preach. I'm not even looking at the people who have gathered here to help us bring worship to you remotely. I'm looking at the camera, which does not really look back to me like the congregation does. But there are people who sometimes come to church for different reasons. They want to be seen. I can't tell you the number of times in an election year when local politicians have shown up in my church on Sunday morning and said, would it be all right, Reverend, if I just address the congregation for a few moments? And which I say to them, is it your testimony about your faith? Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about the election coming up. And then I've had to say to them, sorry, we don't do that because we cannot promote or decry any candidate legally because we're a not-for-profit organization. And you know that, don't you? There are all sorts of reasons to be here, and there are all sorts of reasons that we do the things that we do, but we must do our rituals out of a sense of gratitude and praise toward God and not to make a show. Because what Jesus is saying is that it doesn't matter what the religiosity is as long as it does not reflect your faith and your devotion to God and if it is aimed at someone else. Have you heard the old saying, we've never done it that way before, Reverend? I've heard that many times along the way. I know that there are people who don't like it when we sing a new hymn. A new hymn? Good heavens. Do you still drive your buggy and your horse to church? Do you use the outhouse at your house before you get here? No, probably not, I'm guessing. But then if we don't sing hymns from the 19th century, there are people who don't want to come anymore. I like old hymns. I grew up on old hymns. But I also know that God is giving words and music and songs and heart to people speaking to their soul and they're pouring it out in gratitude and grace to him in music. And that I will continue to honor. But it's hard, isn't it? Because we like things the way we like them. We're so used to tradition. And I've told you, I've had people come into churches before and say, excuse me, you're in my seat to a first-time visitor who ends up being a last-time visitor. I had a congregation once where things were done very properly and always the same way, no matter what. Then there was the Sunday that the acolyte came in sneakers. He had his robe on, the acolyte children who wear an alb much like the one that I have on without the stole on, but they'll light the candles and they'll assist the pastor. You could see his sneakers sticking out from under his alb, and the lady who ran the acolyte program trained them just berated this child until he was in tears and said, if you don't want to do it the right way, you shouldn't do it at all. He took those words to heart, and he never came back to the church again. We have to be careful, don't we, with what we say and how we honor tradition and make sure we don't start worshiping tradition for tradition's sake. The way we say things and how we criticize and how we judge and how we point out other people's flaws isn't just limited to the church, though, is it? I knew a man who told me that his wife's job was to load the dishwasher 
and his job was to follow behind her and reload it the right way. I said, it's a good thing we're not married, darling, because that had been your job the first time you fixed what I had done. And he said to me, there is a right way and a wrong way to do things, and if she won't do it the right way, I have to show her how to do it. And I said to him, have you ever heard the old expression, do you want to be right or do you want to be married? Well, he said, I want to be right, and he is no longer married. Sad, isn't it? We have to be careful about what we hold in our hearts as being true to what God is calling us to do. Whether we're going to be right or righteous. Because you can be right about scripture, but you can be so wrong about how you communicate it to others. The word orthodox is one I use today, that the unorthodox were coming to dinner. The unorthodox, meaning those who didn't subscribe to all the traditions as well as the laws. It's a word that gets thrown around a lot now, especially as the United Methodist Church is on the verge of splitting, and it looks like that is definitely going to happen for sure. If someone disagrees with the way you understand God's word, if someone disagrees with your interpretation of scripture, they'll just say, well, that's all right. You just choose to be unorthodox. I choose to be orthodox. We have to be careful with how we point each other's flaws out, don't we? As Jesus pointed out so very clearly in this story today, both as he defended the actions of his disciples, but also as he challenged the hypocrisy of those who were pointing out the flaws of others. God alone knows the will of God fully. We can't claim to know the mind of God. We can't claim to speak for God in all situations other than speaking the love of God in Jesus Christ for humankind that calls us all to the table, regardless of our sin, regardless of our past mistakes, regardless of our hypocrisy, all are still welcome at the table of God in Jesus Christ. It breaks my heart on what would be a normally a communion Sunday, the first Sunday of the month that we cannot gather. And since we cannot gather, we're not sharing in the meal. But I'm looking to that day of Easter, that great glorious day of resurrection when we will share communion. I know some of you wonder why we're not sharing it remotely because communion is not about what I do. It's not that I am an elder in the church, although that is part of my priestly function as your pastor. But communion is about gathering together in community and until we can do that, we'll just wait until that day. But until then, I want you to remember the words of Jesus that it's not what comes out of your, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you, it's what comes out of your mouth, because what comes out of your mouth is what's coming out of your heart. So I hope that you will. We're going to sing that little song again that we sang as the intro this morning, and we're going to sing it at the end of the service as well. Let the words of my mouth bring you praise. Let the words that I speak be seasoned with your love and grace. May the things, O oh Lord, that I choose to say bring glory, not shame, to your name each day. Let the words of my mouth bring you praise, let them bring you praise. I hope that when you're tempted to criticize or judge or point out the flaws of another or to call someone else unorthodox, that you remember the grace of God that invited you to the table so that you can just say, thank you, Lord, for including me and calling me to include others in your most holy name. Would you rather be right or would you rather be righteous? I'm guessing righteous, and you can be righteous. So don't ask, is something biblical enough? Ask if it's Christian enough. Ask if it's Christ-like enough. Ask if it shows the love of God in Jesus Christ very clearly, because that is what we're called to do, to follow in his name. Then all our traditions will support his law of love and will bring others to the truth of his reign in Jesus Christ, to the glory of God and our Savior. Amen.